Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Simpkins Physics Corner. It's circular motion for AP Physics today. Start you off with a little question. If you are on a merry-go-round and you're going to race your friend, this may sound like a silly question, but let's say here's you joyously riding on merry-go-round, and your friend is back here on the inside, and they are also going around merry-go-round. Well, who is going faster? You could answer this question a couple of ways, right? But let's take a top-down view for what this might look like to see who is going faster. All right, here it comes. Uh, if you're out here on the outside, here's your horse, and then your friend's here on the inside, who's moving faster? All right, so here's the idea. Uh, if I am standing off to the side watching you guys have this race, then I'm going to see you both complete a whole circle in the same amount of time. Most people, when I first ask this question, think it's a silly question because it's like, well, you're both going to come around because the whole thing is a rigid structure that's already like solid together. Why would you gain any ground or lose any ground on your speed, uh, on your friend, right? Well, of course. But what's going on here is something a little more subtle as well. Sure, you would both complete a circle in the same amount of time, but consider this. Which horse, horse A or B, covers a greater distance? Well, of course, this horse would have to go all the way around this huge circle, but B, that horse, would only be going around a small circle. So which horse covers the great amount of distance in the amount of time. Of course, horse A would cover double the distance. If we said that the horse B here was at a radius of R, 1R, and horse A had a radius of 2R, it has double the radius. It's going to cover double the distance. It's going to have a faster speed. Think about like the wind in your hair on the carousel, right? If you were person A or on horse A, you would feel more wind in your face like you're going faster in order to complete that circle in the same amount of time as horse B where you wouldn't feel as much wind in your hair because you'd feel like you were going slower. But the reality is you both go around once in the same amount of time. So <laughs> which horse is going faster? Well, let's consider a circle. How far do you run around a circle? Well, around a circle, you would run a distance of 2 pi r, your circumference. Ah, so the horses are covering different circumferences. How long does it take you to run around a circle? Well, it takes you a time, big T, period. We'll talk about that here in just a second. And how fast do you run around a circle? Well, since speed is distance over time, then the speed or the velocity as we go around this circle is going to have to do with the distance we cover, 2 pi r, divided by the time it takes to cover that distance. And so keep this equation in mind as we continue our conversation here for circular motion. Back in the day when I would run track races, my coach would always yell at me because I was so impatient. The finish line is over here for those of you that have, aren't familiar with how track works. And I would always pass. I'd be in second place and I would always pass my opponent back here on what we call the fourth turn. And my coach would always yell at me for doing that. Well, why is that a bad strategy? Well, if I choose to go to an outer lane, I am then covering a greater distance in the same race as the other person. Well, why would you want to do that? I don't know. I just got excited. The adrenaline started kicking in. If you guys have ever seen a sprint start, you'll notice that they stagger the sprint start. Um, this person in lane eight gets to start way ahead of everybody else, except not really. They get to start ahead of everybody else here, but that's because they have to cover a wider distance. They have to cover a wider circle as they go around the outside. So if I take two people and they run the same speed, but one's in lane one and one's in lane eight, the person in lane one is going to complete that half of a circle much faster than the person in lane eight. You can see how this relates to our idea there of the carousel. So the first thing we need to know is some circular definitions. First one for how long, oh sorry, how long does it take you to run around a circle? Well, we call this the period. It's the time it takes to complete one revolution or one circle, and it's expressed with the variable big T. So if you see big T on your equation sheet, that's going to be representing period. All right, and you'll see those guys down here on your AP physics equation sheet towards the bottom. Um, this t is also represented on your equation sheet here as 2 pi over omega. This little guy here is omega. We'll talk about that. and uh, Or 1 over the frequency. So let's talk about frequency. Frequency is how frequently, it's how many revolutions an object makes in a unit of time. So go back to the carousel. I might say I complete three laps of the carousel per minute. Right? That would be frequency. Um, now, we usually say it as revolutions per second. You, um, and that's how many circles you do you know, in a certain amount of time. And it turns out that if you see this unit hertz, it turns out that a hertz is a revolution per second. How do you remember this? Well, if you spin something around really fast and it hits you in the face, it hurts. All right, so revolution per second is also hertz. And here's the, uh, how you, it would show up on your equation sheet. Frequency is 1 over t. Let's look at our next question. How fast do you run around a circle? Well, this is where we need to differentiate between the wind in our hair on the carousel 
and how long it takes us to go around once on the carousel. So that wind in our hair, that's how fast we're actually moving. Like if I measured how many meters we did around the circle, it's called tangential speed. All right. And so it's kind of like a special version of linear speed, except it's in a circle. It's how fast we're traveling in a circle. So remember, we said that speed is distance over time. And the distance we go around a circle is 2 pi r. The, the term for the time it takes to go around once a circle is called period, the big T. And so if I substitute these guys in, see how if I put 2 pi r on the top and big T on the bottom, this is the equation that I get. Now, this word, tangential, say it with me, tangential. Tangential speed comes from the root word tangent, and tangent is a straight line along the edge of a circle. So you think of like a softball pitcher, right? They come around the circle, and when they release the ball, it flies tangent. So what we say here, when we say that the tangential speed is always tangent to a circle, that means if I'm moving around a circle, if, my, if I'm spinning around like this in this direction, my speed here, my VT would look like that at that edge. It would look like this over at this edge. It would look like this over at this edge. You notice that what these have in common is they're always tangent along the edge of the circle at that moment that you're moving. So that's what we mean when we say tangential speed or tangential velocity. So if you move in a circle, that is not a natural thing to do. Right? It is not natural. If I just like throw something, it's not going to start moving in a circle all by itself. Moving in a circle requires a constant force. Because as we covered in our last two units, in order for a, an object or a mass to accelerate, you have to have an unbalanced force. And so there's going to be a, an unbalanced force needed in order to move in a circle. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. What if I take a tennis ball and I swing it around my head? All right, we're going to ask this question as we go through this unit. What is the centripetal force? It's kind of like that blue superhero chick from X-Men um, where uh, she can morph into anything. Right? She, it's, uh, Mystique is the name of the character. And Mystique can morph into any other person. So this centripetal force is always going to be there causing the circle, but it can morph. It can take different shapes. It can look like different forces as we consider different scenarios. So let's look at um, this one here. If we have a ball on a string, what kind of force is there going to be pulling that ball back towards the center? Or what if we have a car driving around a turn? What kind of force would be causing it to do its circular motion? Of course, if there's not enough of it, it would fly off the road. So this one here, we've seen this fundamental force, one of our four, it's, it's tension. If you have a ball on a string, that would be a force of tension can be the centripetal force. What about going around the turn here? Well, going around the turn, what is the centripetal force? The force of friction in this case is the centripetal force. It takes on the form of friction. What about this one? You guys might have seen these, these at the, uh, the Perkisee Fair, the Gravitron, right? The Gravitron spins around really fast, and some people get so wild that they actually can climb up here and stand on the wall. Well, what would be the force that is acting there? That would actually be the normal force of the wall pressing perpendicularly on us to push us back towards the middle of the gravitron. So the tension force for a ball on a string, the <coughs> um, friction force for a car going around a turn, the normal force for somebody in the gravitron. Already we've seen that the centripetal force can be three different kinds of forces. And of course, if there wasn't a centripetal force, you'd fly out the side and go tangent because it's tangential velocity, right? So you just fly right over the right over the roof there. How about this one for planets that are in orbit? what kind of force would be acting as a centripetal force? Well, this planet right here is not moving in a straight line. It's moving in a circular type path because of the force of gravity. So on a large scale, the force of gravity even can be our centripetal force. So the big idea for today so far is that as we go around the turns, we're going to have two kinds of speeds, rotational speed or frequency, and we're also going to have tangential speed. All right. So if we look at these four scenarios, the type of force that is the centripetal force, what is the centripetal force? FT is the centripetal force for ball on a string. FF is the centripetal force for a car going around a turn. FN is the centripetal force for a gravitron. And FG is the centripetal force for gravitation. So we see that different kinds of forces can act as the centripetal force. But ladies and gentlemen, if you're going in a circle, you're not going in a straight line. If you're not going in a straight line, your velocity is changing. And if your velocity is changing, you are accelerating. And so here's the deal. Whenever something is moving in a circle, it is always accelerating towards the center of that circle or that path that it's making. And in order to cause acceleration, you need sigma f equals ma. All right. So it's still always the answer or it's still always the root of the answer is sigma f equals ma. And, um, and as we look at these types of problems, uh, really, we're just going to be looking at uh, sigma fc equals mac. C standing for centripetal, centripetal coming from the Latin root of centrum patere or center seeking. So that centripetal force is going to be the force that is always acting towards the center of the circle. All right. So here's the big idea for the day. 
If we always have a force towards the center, it is always unbalanced. And if it's unbalanced, then the object is always accelerating. All right. So this is where we get this idea of FC equals AC or the centripetal force that is needed. Uh, the force that is needed to make a circle happen is always going to be centripetal or towards the center of the circle. So you'll see this show up in several different ways. Uh, this is one way you may see it show up, but uh, we'll get into a little bit about where this uh, circular force equation comes from as well. Now, the reason I'm showing you these two side by side is because this equation, oops, sorry, that equation is not on your equation sheet. But what is on your equation sheet is the definition of centripetal acceleration, which is right here. It's AC equals V squared over R. And do you see that if AC equals V squared over R and F equals MA, you follow? If I plug in V squared over R for acceleration, that gets me FC equals M times V squared over R. And if I clean it up, it looks like that. All right. So the equation for AC, centripetal acceleration, is on your equation sheet. This equation is not on your equation sheet, but knowing F equals MA and AC is particular to a circle, we can derive the equation for centripetal force as MVT squared over R. All right, so just to hold the phone here real quick to check in, how fast you are rotating is called frequency. The, how fast you're going along the edge of a circle is called tangential velocity. The acceleration required to move in a circle is called centripetal acceleration or towards the center. And the force needed to maintain circular motion is a centripetal or towards the center force. All right, so those are some recap of some of our big terms for today. Now, on your next page of your note packet, you have something that looks like this. Um, eventually, we are going to go ahead and derive equations and solve these types of problems. But right, right now, it's just a preview. All right, so this one's like for a gravitron. You see, I drew some FBDs here. So for the gravitron, in order to continue spinning around along the edge of that gravitron, you need something pushing us back towards the middle all the time. What pushes us back towards the middle in the gravitron? The wall which is a normal force. How about if you're going around on like a, imagine taking a platform and spinning it slowly and something is sitting on top of it. It'll sit on top of there so long as you don't spin it too fast, right? If you spin it too fast, it'll fly off tangent, right? But as something is going around in a circle, if there's enough friction acting towards the middle, it will stay in its circular path. Right here we have this one is another example of how gravity can be acting as a centripetal force. And then, of course, this ball, although not completing a full circle, is going to be undergoing some sort of circular motion. And since moving in a circle is not natural, we need an unbalanced force. The unbalanced force causing that circular motion is the force of tension, would be acting as a centripetal force there. Um, to wrap up our lesson, what I'd like you guys to do as a quick review is to take a look at the next page in our packet. It has these ladybug problems, and I don't want to reveal all the answers right now, so I'm just going to leave this one. But the slides that I am going off of right now are also posted to Canvas. So what I want you guys to do is try out the ladybug check-in questions, and then go to the slides and hit animate and go through and check your answers after that. Our big terms for today that we covered so far were tangential velocity, that's how fast you go along the edge of a circle, centripetal acceleration, that's your rate of acceleration towards the center, and centripetal force. So to wrap up for today, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Which horse is going around faster? Well, now we know. It depends on what speed you're asking me about. We could say that they rotate with the same angular speed or rotational speed, right? They both complete a circle in the same amount of time, but the outside horse, of course, is moving faster as far as meters per second goes. So our tangential velocity is always going to be in meters per second. And in our next lesson, we're going to talk about the units for angular speed, meaning how often we go around. And angular speed is going to be in this weird unit called radians per second. All right. The other thing we saw today is that frequency is in revolutions. That's really, I don't know why that happened. It's in revolutions per second. All right, so as we look in this unit at circular problems, we're going to have to pay very close attention to our uh, units for speed. If it's meters per second, we're talking tangential velocity. If it's radians per second, we're talking angular speed. And if it's revolutions per second, we're talking frequency. If your head is spinning, that's because we just started circular motion. And so until next time, I'm Mr. Simpkins in the Simpkins Physics Corner.